<laughs> Maybe we can get this light off. It would show up better. Yeah. I had to look online for that picture. That's not my house. <laughs> Nor was it our house when I was a kid, but I thought I need to find something that looks like a feast. You know? And obviously it's probably not an Adventist feast. So <laughs> anyway, but I wanted to get something that would sort of get the idea there, right? Yeah. But I remember as a kid, and we're going to have family coming in. We're going to have family coming in this year from Kansas and St. Louis and, and uh, Spurgeon, Missouri, and locally. So we're, gonna, we're looking forward to Thanksgiving. We're going to have a great time. And I remember as a kid, I, I couldn't wait for Thanksgiving. It was one of my favorite times because all my cousins would come, my uncles and aunts, and I had a lot of cousins. And man, we would play, and uh, we'd look forward to the turkey, of course. We had turkey and stuffing and mashed potatoes and gravy, the usual stuff, uh, and yams. I didn't care for yams that well. And some hotel salad, you know, they, uh, a hotel salad that's, uh, what's that hotel? Waldorf, yeah, yeah, it was a whole Waldorf salad, and I didn't care for that too much either, but my dad made the best pumpkin pie. It was my grandma's recipe from Holland. She was a Dutch, but boy, it was, a, my dad made a great pumpkin pie, so it was uh, one we, we really looked forward to, and then we'd go outside and play football or something outdoors, which was a lot of fun. Usually it was in the snow. Up in Michigan, we... Uh, <laughs> wasn't unusual to be playing in about two or three foot of snow out there. And that was fun. It wasn't as hard to fall down when you got tackled. Didn't hurt so much. Uh, so anyway, I hope everyone here has a place to celebrate this week. If you don't, check with me or one of us here and uh, we ought to be able to arrange something. Because everybody should have a place to go on, on this holiday. And you know, the Bible is full of meals and feasts. It talks about them uh, all through the whole Bible, but specifically I'm going to think about Jesus' life on earth. Jesus attended a number of meals and feasts. They celebrated. You remember Jesus went to the wedding at Cana? He was there for that one. And of course, he saw Zacchaeus, and he went to Zacchaeus' house and had a feast at Zacchaeus' house. And then he had a Matthew. He went to Matthew's house. He had a feast at Matthew's house. Matter of fact, if you look at it and think about it, it seems like Jesus was always eating at somebody's house. And that's probably because he didn't have his own place, so he'd go eat at everybody else's place. And I'm sure they fed him well. And, uh, but Jesus seemed to use these occasions. He seemed to use these occasions to teach great lessons in salvation. And uh, so there's this particular feast in the Bible, though, that Jesus went to, and he told us not to forget it. It was a feast to remember. Amen. I, I went to one of those one time when I was in Florida. My wife used to work for McDill Air Force Base. And at Thanksgiving time, they had a special meal at Thanksgiving time at the Officers Club. And we would go to the Officers Club, and I'm telling you, they had big sections for the entree, another big sections for the salads, another big sections for bread and cheese, another big sections for the drinks of so juice and soda, stuff, another big sections for the desserts. And you had to go from section to section if you wanted to agree, man. It, it was the largest feast I'd ever been to in my life. <laughs> Never forget that one. But Jesus says this one specifically, we are to remember in the Bible. And so, and it's found in all four Gospels. And Jesus, you know, I'm sure he enjoyed visiting with all these people. And this one is found and. uh in these four Gospels, right here. Matthew, chapter 26, verses 6 to 13. Mark, chapter 14, verses 3 to 9. Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. 
and John 12, verses 2 through 8. Now, if you can, maybe slip a piece of paper in each one of those or some kind of a marker because we're going to sort of go back and forth between each of those stories. Uh, they don't all say exactly the same thing. So each one sort of builds upon the other and uh, we can build a, our, our story that way because we'll be going back and forth. I'm going to be drawing from all four of these references this morning. Now there are certain Bible scholars that try to separate the book of Luke, the story in Luke from the rest of them. Luke, it, it, uh, they think that this woman mentioned in Luke who came to this feast at Simon's house was probably a harlot, had been a harlot, and she w probably was Mary Magdalene. I don't think so. I don't agree with that. I think this one in Luke is the same one in all other three. In fact, the Desire of Ages agrees with that idea that this is the same person as it talks about. So let's look at Matthew. We'll start with the one in Matthew, chapter 26, verse 6. The Bible says, And when Jesus was in Bethany, at the house of Simon the leper. So now we know that Jesus is in Bethany. Bethany's about seven, eight miles or so from Jerusalem. That would be like from here to Stoutland exit. Is that seven miles to Stoutland exit? Okay, from here to Stoutland. Not that far. Uh, sleeper. sleeper. The sleeper exit. That's even closer. So people could come down from Jerusalem east. And now you have to remember... By this time, Jesus is very, very popular. Crowds of people are following him everywhere. They're following him to Jerusalem, and he's getting ready to the, in the last part of his life to, to have, go through the Passion Week, the Passover, and his crucifixion. And so there are people coming into Bethany following him, and they're crowding around Simon's house. Simon, we know, at one time was a leper that Jesus healed. And so in his thankfulness to Jesus, he wanted to have a special feast just for Jesus. And of course his disciples and those that were found. And the house became crowded. And anybody that was anybody was probably there. And I wondered in my own mind, I, was wondering, I wonder if Nicodemus was there. It's possible. Nicodemus was there. He's not mentioned in the story. But he was a Pharisee. I mean, he was well known. And we also know when we look over here to chapter, we go to Mark 14, uh, verse 3. No, not that one. I'm sorry, Luke. Let's go to Luke chapter 7, verse 36. This is where it gives us a little more information. Verse 36 of, Mark, of Luke 7. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. So Simon was a Pharisee. What does that tell us about Simon? He was pretty well off. And probably he was a well, well versed in the law. We talked about that in Sabbath school. These people knew the law very well. He was an educated man. And so he was well thought of by the disciples. We're going to Simon's house for a feast. Great. That's going to be a great feast. And so the disciples were all excited. And he went to the Pharisee's house in verse 36 and sat down to eat. Now we're in Luke. This is in Luke. And uh, let me see if John will add anything here in 12 verse 2. It says, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany now, it's six days before the Passover, so it's getting really close to the Passover when Jesus was going to die, where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. So Jesus went to Bethany and probably stayed with Lazarus and Martha and Mary. But the feast, even though it's mentioned here, was not at Lazarus' house. It was at Simon's house. 
So they probably bought a, brought a potluck or something like that dish with them because it says, there they made him a supper and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Now this is important because Lazarus has already been raised from the dead. Okay? There was a lot of people who knew Lazarus. There was a lot of people who knew that Lazarus had been raised from the dead. Would you like to have seen someone who came back from the dead? Yeah. How would you like to go to a, a, a meal where there's going to be somebody that God, that Jesus raised up? And they, they probably asked him questions. What was it like? <laughs> Lazarus. What happened when you died? What was it like? Did you see any angels? Did you go to heaven? Or Lazarus didn't tell him anything because he didn't see anything. He was dead. So he didn't have a, a lot to tell them. But boy, what a story to tell him when he walked out of that tomb and he saw Jesus. Yeah, he was a pretty popular guy there. We're also told that there were other Pharisees there that were planning the death of Jesus. But they had to be real careful because Jesus was so popular and Lazarus was so, so popular that they couldn't touch him or they knew these people would rebel against them in a big way. So a number of the Pharisees that were there and a number of those people who were spying on Jesus trying to trap him were thinking of a way that they could kill him. But they knew that in order to kill Jesus, they were also going to have to kill Lazarus. So they were plotting the death of Lazarus too at the same time. So this is what's taking place at this, this party. And um, so they sit down to eat here. Let's see, I gotta get find find my place here, 12 verse 2. And, the, and Mar Martha, of course, was very busy serving. And then it says in verse uh, in Mark chapter uh, 14, verse 3. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. You know, I'd often wondered what spikenard would smell like. Have you ever smelled spikenard, anybody? I haven't either. I looked it up in the dictionary or in the encyclopedia, and it's supposed to be very costly and, of course, very fragrant. And alabaster is a very soft, beautiful, ivory-type-looking uh, bottle that could be carved into different things. This was so costly... They said that this would about, was about a year's wages. A year's wages for this bottle of perfume. And everybody's crowded, everybody's gathered around, standing around, talking and eating. And it's probably shoulder to shoulder as they're bumping, you know, at some of these kind of parties you go to or some of these kind of feasts where they're like that. And I mean, it wasn't just a few people there. It was really crowded. So Mary... Because of her, it's actually, it just says a woman, it doesn't say Mary. But if we look over in the, in the Gospel of John, um, it tells us, in Gospel of John 12, and in verse 3, Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with with the fragrance of the oil. She also says in the other three Gospels, it says she poured some on his head. Now, she could probably get down on the floor, and I'm sure with all those people walking around and talking about anything and everything, and she could probably, with her tears, I'm sure, dripping on the feet of Jesus, she was down there wiping her feet with her long hair, Weeping, thanking him for what he had done for her. So what did Jesus do for Mary? Forgave her. 
Yeah. This is the sister to Lazarus, the sister to Martha. Mary, who you would think was, I mean, Lazarus and Martha were upstanding, uh, godlike people. And here was Mary from their home who was demon possessed. Not only did God cast out demons out of her one time, but seven different times he cast demons out of Mary. I don't know about you. Maybe you were raised in a, a home that uh, was very upright and well, well, good standing in the community and so forth. I wasn't. Uh, my family, we've got a rather little sordid history. My mom, she had a problem with alcohol. She was an alcoholic most of my life. And uh, so were her sisters. I've had uh, two. I've had two cousins. Uh, I'm sorry. I had two nephews that spent quite a bit of time in prison, and I still have a cousin who's in prison right now, uh, and he'll be there for quite a while. And I just called Voice of Prophecy or uh, Amazing Facts the other day to try to get him some Bible studies over to where he's in prison. And so, yeah. In fact, I remember my Uncle Bill. My Uncle Bill, we lived out in the country, and uh, not, it was in Michigan, so there's a lot of trees, not a lot of fields where we lived, so there's a lot of trees out there, and one of the road that went to our house had one main round curve on it, and my Uncle Bill, he could play the trumpet really great when he wasn't drunk, and he was drunk a lot of the time. He's married to my Aunt Marie. And I remember one night, it was usually on a Friday night, someone banging at the door, and it was my Uncle Bill, all bloodied and all. And we said, what happened? Well, I was coming around that curve, which is about a half a mile from our house, and he missed the curve and hit a tree. So Dad and Mom fixed him up, told us kids to go to bed. It wasn't two months later. There's Uncle Bill, all bloody. No. What happened? He hit the same tree. He hit the same tree, and he was just as drunk as he was the last time. And I couldn't believe it, and my dad couldn't believe it. So they fixed him up, patched him up, and, told him, and took him home. He couldn't drive, obviously. And then there was, oh, probably sometime later, I think about six months later or so, my dad got, my mom got a phone call. It was my Aunt Marie. You got to get over here. Bill is drunk and he's going to, he's beating me. He's, he's going to be, my dad was so, this is on a Friday night. It always happened on Friday night when we were getting ready for Sabbath. And of course, dad, he was, uh, our church, we had a big church of about 300 people. And dad was uh, one of the adult Sabbath school teachers in the, in the church. So they said they'd go over there. And so they went over there and my uncle Bill he was really having a temper tantrum, and he could hardly stand up. And he threatened to hit my dad with a beer bottle. He picked up an empty beer bottle, and he went to swing it at my father. Now, my father usually, and he's a pretty stout uh, Hollander, you know, Dutch guy. And he took his fist, and my dad laid him right out on the floor. And my dad never done anything like that before. And uh, he, then Uncle Bill slept good that night. Um, <laughs> But my dad's hand swelled up like a, you know, it just swelled right up. And he come home to us kids and he says, now don't you guys say anything at church tomorrow about how come my hand is swelled up. And I couldn't wait to tell my friends, you won't believe what my dad did. He knocked Uncle Bill out last night. But he didn't want us to say anything. Uh, well, that's my family history. <clears throat> and it goes a little bit like that. So I can relate to the story of Mary. I relate to Mary. And it's interesting, this quotation, how our families are sometimes. But uh, this quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy, 
Mary had been looked upon as a great sinner. But Christ knew the circumstance that had circumstances that had shaped her life. He might have extinguished every spark of hope in her soul, but he did not. Amen. Now you have to remember, in, in Simon's mind, the, the one who was having the uh, party, when he saw what was happening, and we're going to go to, I'm going to go back to Luke for this. And uh, as soon as I can find it right here. Luke chapter 7. He says, the Bible says, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to him saying, this man, if he were truly a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who's touching him. For she is a sinner. I am thankful that the Lord lets sinners touch him. Amen. And that he can touch us. Amen. That there's that interaction there. Because that gives hope for me. It said, he had lifted her from despair and ruin. Seven times she had heard his rebuke of the demons that controlled her heart and mind. She had heard his strong cries to the Father on her behalf. She knew how offensive is sin to his unsullied purity. And in his strength, she had overcome. She couldn't do it on her own. She tried and she failed. Seven different times at least these demons. And they may have even been the same sin. We don't know. It doesn't matter. But it was in the strength that Jesus gave her that she did overcome. And she had victory. Praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for that. So families are important. And it doesn't matter, folks. It doesn't matter the situations our families are in. God can still help them. God has that kind of power. And he knows everything about us. And he knows everything about our situation. And so what happens? So in verse 40 of chapter 7 of Luke, Jesus answered and said to him, knowing what he was thinking, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, say it. What is it? Tell me. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors who owed 500 denarii and the other old 50. Well, we know the difference between 500 and 50. 10, what is that? 10 times, 10 times different. Simon answered, now he said, And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Now tell me, he says, which of them do you think will love him more? And Simon said, well, I suppose the one that was forgiven more. Jesus said, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, You see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, which would have been the hospitable thing to do and the proper thing to do. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet, and also in other places it said he, she anointed his head also with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are what? Forgiven. Forgiven. For she loved much, 
But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with it would began to say, who is this who even forgives sins? And then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. You don't need to worry about it anymore, Mary. It's all taken care of. It's all taken care of. Forgiveness. Jesus knows. Jesus knows the circumstances of every soul in here. He knows every part of our life. You may say, I'm sinful. You may be very sinful. I'm sure there's things about you that nobody knows. There's things about me nobody knows or that I would want them to know. But he turns no weeping contrite one away. No contrite weeping one he turns away. He does not tell any all that he might reveal, but he bids every trembling soul take courage. Freely will he pardon all, all who come to him forgiveness, for forgiveness and restoration. The sad part of the story is this. The person that Jesus was forgiving the most was not Mary. It was Simon. Because Simon was the one that led Mary into sin. He got her started in this whole mess to begin with. But now he's playing like he's, who me? You know, what what did I do? You know. And he's the host of the party. But Jesus could read Simon's heart. And you know what's so amazing about all this? Jesus knowing how, what Simon had done and that he was the one that led Mary into sin did not expose Simon to anybody else in the room. Amen. Amen. He didn't say, hey, let me tell you folk about this guy. You know, there were other people like Judas in the room too who said, they at different times said, whoa, we could have sold this. We could have sold this for 300 pence or whatever, denarian. We could have given it to the poor. Judas didn't want to give the money to the poor. He's the purse keeper. We also know that he was a thief. Judas was a thief. The one whose feet Jesus washed. And wanted him in his kingdom. One of the disciples. And so all the other people were also sort of putting this whole act down. But Jesus did not expose Simon before the people. He was trying to reach out to Simon to touch his heart. Amen. And there's a lesson in that for us, folk. Amen. Let me... Did I finish this? Let me... I think I did. Yeah. Read this one here. Simon was touched by what? The kindness of Jesus. And not openly rebuking him before the guests. He had not been treated as he desired Mary to be treated. He saw that Jesus did not wish to expose his guilt to others but sought by a true statement of the case to convince his mind and by pitying kindness to subdue his his heart. Stern denunciation would have hardened Simon against repentance, but patient admonition convinced him of his error. He saw the magnitude of the debt which he owed his Lord. His pride was humbled. He repented. And the proud Pharisee became a lowly, self-sacrificing disciple. Jesus is to won him over. Folks, 
do we do that in our everyday contact with one another in the church? I'm not thinking outside the church. I think sometimes we treat people outside the church better than we treat people in the church. I think we need to be more patient and more kind with the folk here in the church, with each other, and with our families. I know sometimes we're rough on our families. We're rough on our wives and our brothers and sisters and kids. I think we need more kindness, more patience, and less pride. And that's and right. And God can do that. And we all need to do that. We all need to pray for one another like that. Amen. When I was a kid, I was a pathfinder. And you ever gone on one of those 50 miles? You might have heard this story. That's okay if you hear it again. Some of you haven't heard it, so I'm going to tell it. We go on a 50 mile bike hike, and you had to go on a 50 mile bike hike to get your honor. That's all I needed. I had already assembled and disassembled and reassembled a bike and all that, and I knew the parts and all that. All I lacked was a 50-mile bike hike. So the church got together. Oh, there must have been about 25 of us or, or more. might have been more than that. We had a big old group of cyclists. And we were going to go 25 miles to this park, have lunch at the park, turn around, and then come back 25 miles. And that gets our... our, our, our my, my badge, my honor. And so it was fun. Oh, it was great. All the way there. Of course, as kids, us guys, we try to outdo each other and get ahead, of course. And then the uh, counselors try to, hey, get back here. And so they try to keep you all corralled because there's also traffic going up and down this road. It was a highway, but it wasn't the main highway. And so anyway, we finally got to the park. And of course, there was a a, a, a car following that brought the lunches and everything with them. So they set out and we did our lunches and had our sack lunches and everything like that. And of course, the first thing you do when you go to a new place with Pathfinders and kids, you go exploring. You want to go exploring. So us guys, we went exploring up into the woods. Nice park, you know, picnic tables and everything, but they had a nice hill there. There were some hills and woods, so we wanted to go up into the woods, and we were doing some exploring, and we found this tree, this big tree, and it had this long vine hanging down. You know, vines off a tree? And the bottom part of that vine was sort of white, and you could tell it had been well used by other explorers. And so as the kids were grabbing onto that vine and they were swinging out there and swinging back. Next one got onto the vine, he swung way out there. Now the hill's going down like this. So you're swinging out over the hill, you know, and then you swing back. And then next person and so forth. And then it became a contest. Who could swing out the farthest? I said, I can swing out and touch that tree. No! I said, you watch me. <laughs> yeah, I did. I swung out there, and I touched that tree, and I said, Geronimo. That's what I said, Geronimo. And I went right on past that tree and kept right on going. In space, it was a long way, because it was a long way down. My my, my hand slipped right off of the end of that. Everybody was dead quiet. Bam! I hit the ground, rolled over, and I wasn't breathing. I landed on my back and knocked the wind out of me for sure, and I was unconscious. They ran and got my dad, who was a counselor, and he came over, and he was lifting my waist. My leg, he was doing what they could do for football players, I guess, lifting my, my belly up or my waist up and trying to get me breathing again. And finally, I coughed and I got breathing again. But I couldn't ride back. 
<laughs> there went my honor right out the window. A little bit of pride, I lost my honor. Put me in the car. It was a wagon. It was a, a, a car was the, they used to have the uh, wagons, you know, station wagon. And about halfway back, I said, I don't feel so good. And so they said, you better get it. They pulled over. I got out of the car. And I could see the bicycles coming up the road. And boy, here I am on the side of the road throwing up. And my friends are driving by. And I'm just throwing up, heaving like crazy. And I had to go to the hospital the next day. They had to check my chest and for broke because it hurts so bad. It hurts so bad. But I didn't have anything broken, but I was bruised really bad. My pride was probably bruised the worst. <laughs> because I thought for sure, I thought for sure that uh, I was going to show everybody up. I didn't show anybody up. Sometimes we have to be humbled. Simon needed to be humbled. But Simon was humbled in a, such a way that Jesus is able to touch his heart. Amen. And then what's interesting, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 13, Assuredly, Jesus says, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told as a what? A feast to remember. Let's turn to our closing song, number 540. <laughs> 